So a uh, little bit about the Gretchen Swanson Center before we get started. We are a research and evaluation center, um, and we work across a lot of different programs. The one that I'm going to talk to you about today is GustNet, but we also have um, research and evaluation with WIC. Uh, we partner with uh, local community uh, programs, foundations to do research and evaluation. We also do strategic planning as well. Um, and we are an uh, organization that's headquartered in Omaha, Nebraska, and we have uh, 45 employees across 23 different states because we're remote. So I hail from Montana. If you all went to Montana today, you would be surprised by the four feet of snow that's on the ground. Um, and I am very surprised by your wind. So we have like equal surprise. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, okay, so what I'm going to talk about today um, is the Nutrition Incentive Hub, which is uh, what the, uh, it, it's a part of the USDA GUSNIP program, and um, I'll tell you a little bit why we're, why I'm going to talk about that. But first, um, the Gretchen Swanson Center for Nutrition um, leads, I'm going to call it the NTAE, but the, the um, long version of that is the Nutrition Incentive Program Training Technical Assistance Evaluation and Information Center. Um, and with that, we have partnered, we have a coalition of partners that work together to um, help uh, projects, programs and projects across the U.S., just like you, um, to implement a produce prescription or a nutrition incentive program. <clears throat> and so within GUSNIP, there are two different project types. Um, there are nutrition incentives. Nutrition incentives are nutrition incentive projects that provide incentives to purchase fruits and vegetables among individuals using SNAP. Um, I'm not going to talk about the nutrition incentive side of things today. I'm going to talk about the, the produce prescription side of GUSNIP today. Um, which are providing incentives in the form of prescriptions um, to purchase fruits and vegetables for individuals with low income um, and that are at height, uh, uh, heightened risk for a chronic diet-related chronic disease. Um, as you all know, they operate in the primary care setting. The big th difference about GUSNIP and what's happening in Kansas is that GUSNIP focuses on fruits and vegetables, and you all are focusing on um, a wider variety of options. But there's a lot we can learn um, from each other, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, right now, there are 182 total GUSNIP awards um, across the U.S. And so uh, the next slide, 116 of those are produce prescription projects. Um, they span 36 states. Um, they span urban, rural, urban and rural, and tribal settings. Um, and so um, what we at the NTAE have the fortunate opportunity is to learn from all these produce prescription um, projects that are being implemented across the United States. Food as medicine is certainly a movement um, that's happening, and I think that Hillary really spoke about that well earlier today. Um, and GUSNIP is one part of the food as medicine movement. Um, we have the opportunity to work with 116 projects right now. So we really get to see um, across all of the rural spaces or across all of the urban spaces or across all of the tribal spaces um, and across all of the projects, what, what's, what are successes, what are um, barriers, what are the outcomes um, around these these projects? <clears throat> we do have one Kansas grantee in the room, uh, the Community Health Center of Southeast Kansas that we do work with. Um, and I'll talk a little bit of more about the um, opportunities for GUSNIP to apply, but um, certainly um, you all seem like you're in a good spot for GUSNIP funding. <clears throat> so what I view, um, view us being here as is an opportunity for shared learning. So um, I just have to say, wow, the work that you all are doing in Kansas is incredible. The team that Sunflower Foundation put, has put together and the investment that they have um, put into these projects and the reality of what it takes 
to have a project um, go through pre-implementation, implementation and evaluation is incredible. And the fact that you all are invested in doing this work and you're in it for the long term, um, I'm in awe of you and um, just just um, am super impressed by the work that's being done in Kansas. The evaluation team that supports this work is also um, looking at every facet of um, of of the important um, outcomes that are possible with food as medicine. Um, and I think that you all working together to um, come up with, to develop a ground up approach um, that's realistic is, is, um, ha has been what's impressed me. Um, so I view, you know, talking about Gusnip and then Chris is going to talk about some other projects um, that he works on and that are also at the center as an opportunity for shared learnings because we are in a movement together around food as medicine. We're trying to make systems change, cultural change, a lot of these things that have came up yesterday and have um, been talked about today. And as we are all um, thinking about implementing, then implementing and evaluating these projects, there are things that we can be learning uh, together and hopefully form best practices um, for the future. So um, I I talked through this in depth yesterday. I know there are some new folks here. So I did want to um, just tell folks briefly about how gusnet produce prescriptions typically work. Um, so patients are go through eligibility screening um, and then they're provided a healthcare provider referral. Um, then they're provided with a produce prescription, um, which looks very different from clinic to clinic. And the produce prescriptions are typically for fresh fruits and vegetables. Sometimes they're for um, frozen or canned. Um, the patient then goes uh, to, they receive produce either at a clinic or at a food retailer. So in Gusnip, um, a lot of uh, projects are partnered with like a local grocery store or farmer's market where the produce is actually redeemed. Um, and then lots of, of the projects provide nutrition education and other supports such as transportation to sites, especially in rural areas. Um, and then our function at the NTAE is to provide technical assistance and evaluation along the way. And this is where we get to learn, um, work with grantees through um, their successes and challenges and help them to, um, to evaluate their projects. <clears throat> so what we really learned um, during all of this is that there's a lot of capacity building that has to happen along the way to deliver a produce prescription project. And I feel like this is the, this is a reoccurring theme um, of, of, of this um, conference. And um, I really like this framework for building capacity in public health. Um, and I'll go a little bit more through the framework um, in a in a in a moment, but I want to say is like when you look at that framework, that's a lot of things to build capacity around. Um, and so when when um, I hear about you all having um, having challenges, um, having small wins, which I think are actually really big wins. Um, I think about this in the back of my mind, like all of the things that have to happen for a small win and for a system to shift um, in order to make a food as medicine program work in a clinic. So the resources that are involved, the knowledge that has to be there, um, the leadership that has to support the project, whether it's whether it's from internal leadership, policymakers, the Sunflower Foundation, evaluators, any of that type of leadership, the clinic champions themselves, um, and then all the foundational elements that go into uh, uh, making, making projects work. Partnerships, organizational development, project management, um, making sure that, uh, that the project is high quality, workforce development. We've heard a lot about um, staff turnover and community development. This is what we hear across 116 produce prescription projects in the United States um, and what it takes to build capacity to actually make that project go forward. 
Um, and so it's, it's a process and, um, it, and, uh, we're, the NTAE is there to support folks wherever they are in their capacity building, but it's absolutely an important, um, part of the, uh, the endeavor. So I have right here a timeline that a typical Gustin grantee goes through. Um, but the point of this timeline is to show that um, that along the way from before applying for a Gustin grant all the way to closing out a, a Gustin grant, there are necessary um, areas to build capacity in through information, technical assistance, and evaluation support. Um, <clears throat> and we have seen this as, as such a need that we provide capacity building and innovation fund dollars to grantees um, for uh, either planning for a grant or during their grant, um, having even extra dollars beyond their GUSNIP funds to uh, build capacity or do an innovation in their program. Because this work, as we've heard, is not easy. Um, it's important, but it does take um, it t does take a lot of capacity building. So applying uh, applying learnings um, from what we've learned at the NTAE um, when working with Gusset grantees, we've learned all of these things in blue, which are a lot of things. Um, are required to build capacity. And so um, this type of work uh, is being in it for the long game because you're taking your clinic and you are uh, changing the clinic culture, you're changing workflows, you're building new partnerships and communities. Um, it requires human financial and infrastructure resources, knowledge and um, knowledge in the development of strategies to be able to resolve issues leadership from all sectors to support the vision for food as medicine, diverse partnerships in healthcare, um, as well as the food sector, agriculture sector, funders, policymakers, payers, um, insurers, project management that's ongoing um, and has technical assistance, evaluation and information support to, uh, to improve what we know. Some of these words are looks like they got cut off on this slide, but um, engagement with communities to make the, the projects localized. What I think is so special about like the work that I get to do and even coming here and seeing how um, different each project is to, to fit the needs of a community. Um, and this increases buy-in in implementation. Um, and then uh, improving work workforce capacity and competency to deliver the program over time in the midst of um, staff turnover and all of the other um, workflow things that are required. So when we all work together to share our best practices from the NTAE, from your collaborative, um, we emerge with best practices across the field. So this, again, this is a new and innovative field. Um, we're part of a systems and a cultural shift that's needs strategies, resources, and solutions for a variety of settings, populations, and partnerships. There's definitely not a one-size-fits-all approach that I've seen. Um, and so I think it's important to realize that um, best practices have to fit the needs of, of um, communities. So um, the Nutrition Incentive Hub website is a publicly available website for everyone who is implementing a produce prescription project or a food as medicine project. There's lots and lots of resources um, about the best practices that we're learning along the way. Um, and Sunflower Foundation, I know, is providing you with some best practice resources. Um, and uh, so I, I think that this this field is like ripe for learning um, as as we're as we're growing. <clears throat> so the other thing that I want to say is that um, evaluation, so like shared evaluation is one thing that the NTAE does um, with grantees, and it helps us to demonstrate impact across a variety of projects at different capacities, which I think is really, really important that we're demonstrating impact with projects that reach five people, we're demonstrating uh, impact with projects that reach 15 people, we're demonstrating impact with projects that reach 
50 people because together that is almost 100 people. And so I think um, if you can think about sharing evaluation as much as possible, that approach is really helpful for uh, being a part of a movement in a field that's growing. Um, and when your clinic reaches 15 people, which is amazing, um, you're also, you know, working alongside your wonderful evaluators to um, show that that the impact across food is medicine in Kansas, for example. So at the NTAE, we look at things um, like fruit and vegetable intake, food security. We're working on health outcomes and health utilization. Um, we are working on electronic health care uh, record or electronic health record data. Um, we look at just reach metrics, like so how many um, how many uh, prescriptions were prescribed, how many of them were redeemed, so things like that. Um, that can show like across all of the grantees at the NTAE, what is the impact that's being made on the field? And we can see higher fruit and vegetable intake, higher food security. Um, we we can see the uh, impact in local communities. So looking at the store level data and the farmer's market data. Um, and and um, so buy into your evaluation and um, it's something to be excited about. <clears throat> so the last thing before I turn it over to Chris is just talking about the framing of food as medicine, which we heard a little bit about today. Um, that it's not just the food. So food as medicine is truly, uh, is part of it is food, but the rest of it is addressing the social determinants of health. And so addressing education access and quality, healthcare access and quality, neighborhoods and built environments, social and community context, economic stability, patients come to clinics with all of those things um, and those drivers and uh so food as medicine is focused on food as one tool, but uh, projects and uh, projects really uh, position themselves when they engage in food as medicine to start addressing the holistic needs of patients. And so I think that's a really important framing for food as medicine is that we are, are, are also thinking about providing food, but also um, quality healthcare and uh, thinking about it holistically. So it's important to leverage food as medicine holistically for improved patient care, clinic culture, community economic impact. Like, so thinking about those larger things that food as medicine is doing, um, those, those will uh, um, result in increased um, fruit and vegetable intake if you're in a produce prescription project or increase healthy diet if you're doing um, a larger focus on, um, on whole foods, um, decrease food insecurity, improved health outcomes, decrease healthcare use and costs. So um, I think leveraging food as medicine holistically to ensure that um, it is addressing the whole patient is improving clinic culture and is creating a community impact, economic impact, it are all really important drivers. <clears throat> so I talked a lot about GUSNIP also woven, um, a lot of the work you're doing, but if you are interested in applying um, to GUSNIP, we're here to help. Um, we have an email address, ta at nutritionincentivehub.org uh, that you can email. You can also just email one of us. Um, and we have a website with lots and lots of resources. So uh, last thing I'll say is growing food as medicine together is, is, really, um, is really my interest in talking to you all today. So um, ways to do that are thinking about diverse and sustainable funding that values capacity, pre-implementation, implementation, and evaluation. So um, a lot of the discussions yesterday talked about the need for resources for staffing and for food. Um, and valuing that planning time. Um, sources of food that fit local geographies, so thinking about that food procurement piece. Multi-sector partnerships, um, willing to try innovative strategies and solutions, and leadership that is invested in health equity. 
So with that, I will turn it over to Chris. Can you? Thank you. This on. What about now? Wow. That's awesome. <laughs> I think so. They're pretending like it worked. <laughs> so I was going along with it. Um, so thank you for having us here today. And one of the things I wanted to say at the very beginning is, you know, Kansas doesn't always, you know, end up at the center of the national conversation, right? But this morning, I'm, I'm from Arkansas, by the way, and if Jerry Jones from Feeding America is on this thing, I apologize that the Razorbacks beat the Jayhawks, man. I'm sorry. Um, the, so being from Arkansas, similar to being from Kansas, we're not always at the center of attention. But this morning, you have Hillary Seligman, who's one of the really most important national leaders in sort of figuring out the direction for food, for food as medicine in the United States. She took time out of her day. She was sick. I don't know if you could tell, but she probably rolled out of bed just this morning from San Francisco to talk to you. There's folks from USDA on the Zoom and in the room because they want to know what's going on in Kansas. There's Jerry Jones, who I just called out about basketball, a Kansan who works at Feeding America on their equity issues, who joined today to find out what's going on in Kansas. So the, the rest of the time that Carmen and I are going to be talking to this morning or this afternoon now, is to figure out where does Kansas fit into this picture. So these slides, if you were here yesterday, my first three slides are going to be exactly the same as they were yesterday, so I apologize for that, but they're going to go to a very different place. So please bear with me for a sec, but there's new folks on the Zoom and in the room. And so I want to talk a little bit about, uh, Carmen talked about USDA's interest in food as medicine, particularly around the GustNet program. Another big sort of player in the world of food as medicine is the National Institutes of Health. They fund a lot of scientific research into, you know, how can we understand that sort of effectiveness part that Hillary was talking about this morning. This is one of the projects that, that I'm lucky enough to be part of that's part of the Gretchen Swanson Center. I developed this project in Arkansas, where I'm from, and it's working with rural clinics. Several of y'all are rural clinics, right? We know that rural clinics reach folks that are experiencing usually communities with high prevalences of type 2 diabetes and food insecurity, higher than lots of other areas. And then these are also communities where it's often difficult to access diabetes support resources. So this is a pretty typical kind of research study. We're looking at about 400 patients, 200 of them get to be involved in a home food grocery delivery program, and 200 of them sort of get to have standard care. We're following them over 12 weeks. We're looking at things like their glycemic control, psychosocial variables, like how is your diabetes related stress? How's their sort of economic situation in your home? We're also looking at this really important variable that's gonna keep coming up in the food as medicine conversation. And that has to do with cost effectiveness. Like what, how much does it cost and what's the return on investment? So that's just one example of what NIH is interested in. There's other studies all over the US that are following similar sort of trajectories. Another group that's really interested in food as medicine are philanthropic funders, you know, just like the Sunflower Foundation. Here's another project that I'm really, really excited about that I'm lucky to be part of. And it's a partnership between Feeding America and a foundation called the Elevance Health Foundation. And it's a it's a it's a partner or it's a study that's going to follow 21 different food banks with their healthcare partners all over the United States doing really innovative and exciting things, very similar to what's going on here in Kansas, what folks have been talking about this morning. And our job is going to be to try to understand what happens when we provide uh, neighbors who are visiting these, these clinics that um, test are screen positive for food insecurity with healthy food, with nutrition, education, and counseling in a lot of cases, and with assistance signing up for SNAP in a lot of places where it's kind of tricky and complicated to sign up for SNAP for various reasons. We're gonna be looking at several different, oh wow, it sounds a lot different over here. We're gonna be looking at several different outcome metrics. Several of the ones are the ones that Hillary was talking about this morning, because this is a very large study. So one of them we're gonna be looking at is food security. We're gonna be looking at fruit and vegetable intake. We're gonna be looking at some of the effects on the household economics of folks who are, who are participating in the program as well as health and healthcare utilization. And the data sources that we have 
our surveys, just like y'all are doing with some of your participants, we're looking at some surveys at pre and post to understand how they are experiencing the 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 the, pro the programs, as well as EHR extraction from some of the clinics. So we have a nice relationship with some of those clinics. They're going to be sharing some of the health outcomes data that Hillary was talking about. And because Elevance is a healthcare payer, they used to be called Anthem Health. Some of you might be familiar with them under that name. We also have access to their claims data. So we do get to take a little bit more of a bird's eye view and look at them over a longer period of time than is easy to look at in an EHR. We also get to see their sort of cross provider utilization, which you can't see inside of your clinic's EHR in a lot of situations. So that's, that's a, that's a really extreme version of, of philanthropic investment in food as medicine. Also, Hillary talked this morning about being a part of the group of people that got to inform the White House strategy for, you know, health and hunger and nutrition, which is a really exciting document. You can download it. Probably nobody's ever said that before. Let's, let's be real. It's not really an exciting document unless you're a person who's really interested in policy, and then it is really an exciting document. But one of the paragraphs in there explicitly describes the role of, of food as medicine and Medicare and Medicaid and how it would be awesome if we were able to expand that role, according to the people like Hillary that, that wrote that proposal. That's just a proposal. The conference that surrounded this, this document was a bipartisan conference. So maybe there's a chance that some of these policies will start to happen and we'll have to see that over time. But if you're interested in what the White House thinks is a good direction for food as medicine in terms of like Medicare, Medicaid flexibilities, you should definitely check out this document as well. But that, that's a policy group that's very interested in food as medicine. So what do we have? We have USDA, we have NIH, we have philanthropy, we have the White House, we have Congress as well was part of this work. And now we have Kansas. And so this is the same map I showed yesterday. And I joked yesterday that it was like, oh, this is just the prettiest map of Kansas that I could find. It's just a wind speed map. What, is, what does that mean? This morning I woke up, my eyes are bright red. <laughs> I can barely open them. I feel like every bit of pollen and trash that is in the air in Kansas went into my eyes yesterday. So now I, I'm not, I don't think this is a funny or pretty map anymore. Like this is, this is real stuff today. But one of the things, oops, I forgot, I forgot the key point, which is I was trying to learn about Kansas. And one of the things I learned yesterday is that Kansas does not touch an ocean, which reminded me of some other things that don't hang out near the ocean or that do hang out near the ocean actually. So if, if we're thinking about things that are close to the ocean, a lot of GusNet programs are close to the ocean. More than half of our produce prescription grants in the NTAE are in the states that touch the Pacific or the Atlantic Ocean. So that's, that's some things that are by the ocean. Kansas still not by the ocean. I looked at NIH's portfolio of nutrition research. It's pretty hard to quantify where all their dollars go that are specific to nutrition. But this is an example. They launched uh, a really cool initiative um, that's got to do with genetics and precision nutrition. They funded 16 sites across the United States. Most of them, 70% almost, are in states that touch an ocean. You can still see over here, there's a lot of states that don't touch the ocean and don't have one of those sites. Here's the opposite version of that. There's a lot of states that are called idea states, and those are states that have historically received a low amount of funding from the NIH. Here, a lot of, a lot of those don't touch an ocean. So now we have the opposite thing. So like the people that like Kansas, they're in the middle state that does not touch an ocean and is one of those states that gets less science funding historically than the other states. Here's an example of a philanthropic project. The Feeding America project has a lot, it's a lot more spread out than some of those other projects that we've talked about with like the Precision Nutrition Center. But even there, we see all these awesome projects happening all over the United States, but we still see a really big circle here in the middle where there's not one of those food bank health system partnerships that, that applied for and got funded from Feeding America. So what the heck is going on? Like, I know there's USD people, USDA people on this call. There's Feeding America people on the call. They're probably not maybe thrilled with the things that, that I'm pointing out right now. But I know that they really want to have projects in that circle, in that middle part of the country. They're asking us to. Part of me and Carmen's job 
is to figure out how to get more GustNet programs in some of the states that don't have as many. So this isn't their choice. They can't control whether it's Feeding America or NIH or USDA who applies for these programs. But it's, it is noticeable that those programs tend to cluster a little bit more in the states that touch the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean. So what does that make me think when I was, when I was trying to figure out what Carmen and I were going to talk about? One thing that it makes me think is we need to hear more from you in Kansas. Like y'all are doing amazing things and you don't touch an ocean. So that makes you different than a lot of the people that we're hearing for, hearing from. You've got six amazing food as medicine programs, one of which is a GUSNIP grantee. So like Kansas, like Southeast Kansas, y'all are doing your part to get your voice out there. So congratulations. Maybe we can get some more of y'all to, to take the plunge. We, I'm sure that that would be an awesome thing if that happened. But you've got six partnerships already here that are doing great things that we're going to hear a little bit more from in a second. Kansas also presents an opportunity for us to learn what works in specific communities that all live within a single state. You're all in different contexts. You know, like if we took the Hoxie people to the Dodge City people to the Southeast Kansas people, you have different communities. The communities have different priorities. They have different challenges. They have different strengths and opportunities. This project that's happening right now at, the, at, at Sunflower and with, with your help is one way that we can all sort of pay attention and learn with the help of your evaluation team what's working well in different places and what, what could be improved in different places. We also get to say, you know, what does food as medicine look like in a relatively conservative political policy environment? You know, a lot of those states that are on the coasts look very different policy wise than a state like Kansas. And so having these six partnerships that are happening right now in this one place, we can start to say, you know, what's palatable to people in that circle where there aren't as many programs that are being funded in food as medicine world. Because one thing that, that we know, those of us who live here in the middle of the country, we sometimes hear our policymakers expressing discomfort about, you know, feeling like people from other places are coming to tell them how to do stuff. Kansas presents an opportunity for y'all to really shine with your food as medicine work and be an example to all those other states that are around you. You can be an example to, to my state like Arkansas that doesn't have a ton of, of food as medicine programming happening right now. So you could inspire more folks outside of Kansas and around you to sort of take the plunge and, and jump into this world. So what can you teach all these folks? If, if, if you keep going with the, with the progress that you're already making, what can everybody else learn from Kansas? Well, one thing I think that we're still trying to figure out across the country is, is where's all the food going to come from in food as medicine? Like, are we going to be getting food from, from local and regional growers? Are we going to be getting food from the food bank system? We're going to be getting food from large grocery retailers. We're going to get food from, you know, mailbox shippers that, that drop things on people's front porch. What's going to work well in a place like Kansas? And is that the same thing that's going to work well in terms of food sourcing in, in California or New York or Florida? You know, what's, what is going to be the role of the charitable food system? You know, we heard awesome presentations this morning from our food bank partners here in Kansas about what are their opportunities and their strengths and their challenges as well. So how is that going to work over the long run? In what ways are they going to be the right partners for some interventions and maybe not the best partners for other interventions? That's something that Kansas is going to be able to teach your neighbors and everybody else. Who's going to be the beneficiary of food as medicine? You know, Hillary got at this a little bit this morning, but who, who are the people that are going to benefit are we going to are we going to figure out ways for local and regional growers to benefit from food as medicine? Are we going to figure out ways for local and regional grocers to benefit from food as medicine? In my project in Arkansas with the rural clinics, we partner with smaller grocery stores because it was easier than partnering with larger grocery stores because they were really excited to be part of that conversation and they had a lot less sort of red tape and infrastructure to deal with. We only had to talk to two grocery stores to cover five clinics because they were jumping at the opportunity to say, like, you know, nobody ever asked us to do that kind of thing. So are they going to be part of food as medicine here in Kansas and elsewhere? You know, are payers and insurance companies going to benefit from food as medicine? They're really interested in this conversation, too. Like, they're trying to figure out how that makes sense. Um, 
large national retailers want to be a part of food as medicine. There are conversations happening with some of the biggest retailers that you can contemplate that are trying to figure out what their role is going to be in food as medicine. You know, people are going to be figuring out as Medicare and Medicaid flexibilities happen, there's probably going to be meal box shippers that are going to be starting to scale up their opportunities to participate in the world of food as medicine. The, the, the one group that we sometimes forget to talk about is the one that you six clinics spend the most time talking about and thinking about, which are the community members and the patients that you're working with. Like, how are we going to keep making sure that they benefit from participating in food as medicine? That's something else that Kansas is going to be able to teach folks with the innovative work that y'all are doing here. Another couple of questions are, you know, are we going to be able to improve quality of life and save healthcare costs? Is that something that can really happen? Like, I, I hope so. We're, we're trying to do that. What's going to be the, the, the driving force of food as medicine in Kansas and elsewhere? Is it going to be a situation where we're focused on, on saving costs as sort of a primary driver? Or is it going to be a conversation where we're like, oh my gosh, people are like, is that the wind? It's the wind. Y'all, I'm, I'm leaving Kansas in like two hours. I'm, <laughs> I don't like, this is getting creepy. Um, but is our food as medicine work in Kansas and, and elsewhere going to be about helping you clinic folks build relationships with your patients? Or is it going to be really, really focused on the bottom line? And that's what's going to drive policy. That's something else that Kansas is going to be able to play a part in that conversation. That conversation is happening right now. And it's something that, that we need your input on. Another thing that Hillary talked about a whole lot this morning is how do we know if it's working? You know, how do we know if food as medicine is working or not? You've got an awesome evaluation team that we've heard from a couple of times over the last couple of days. They're measuring a lot of really important things. They're asking you questions. They're trying to learn from you. Like, what are the effects of your projects here in Kansas? You know, we, we already kind of have a sense, like Hillary was saying, that these programs are pretty good at improving food security. They're pretty good at improving fruit, fruit and vegetable intake. We know that if you improve both of those things, you have a really good chance of improving health outcomes. And if you improve health outcomes, you've got a really good chance of improving health utilization. I think one of the things that we need to have sort of a, a nuanced view of, which we talked about a little bit yesterday, is how we think about health utilization now. And, and like Hillary mentioned, what's our time frame? You know, are we looking to change healthcare utilization for the next nine to 12 weeks? You know, that's, that's a pretty tall order, right? Most of us who have type two diabetes don't, you know, get hospitalized or visit the emergency room every nine, tw nine weeks or whatever. So that's where we probably won't be able to see a huge change in that kind of utilization in nine weeks. But we might in 12 months, we might in three years, we might in five years. So the question that, you know, that, that Hillary was getting at is, you know, are we looking to sort of change or sort of acutely what's happening during these 12 or, 15, 12 or so weeks? Or are we looking to change the system and what happens for most people for a long period of time? And I, I tend to agree with Hillary that like, if we can integrate this into clinics like you're doing right now, as a sustained service that's out there for folks, then you're going to change a whole lot of people's health a little bit in a way that is going to save costs and is going to save utilization that we, that we don't want to have over a long period of time. I tend to think of it as something like fluoridation of water, right? Of water, right? So like your dental insurance company is probably pretty cool with paying for fluoridate, fluorid, fluoridating your water because that saves them over time, it, if, if you have a cavity though, fluoridation doesn't just like magically get rid of your cavity and take out your root canals, right? It's a thing that you have to sort of have as part of your system, as part of your sort of bag of tricks to be able to improve the health of everybody over a long period of time. And then, you know, a couple of other outcomes that I think are really important for us to keep in mind is patient quality of life. Like if we only ask them about their A1C, and we only ask them about, did they go to the emergency department? We don't sometimes remember to ask them, like, are they having a better time playing with their grandkids? Are they able to sort of go out and go for a walk or go work in the yard or be able to spend time with people that they love? Like, please don't forget to ask those kinds of questions. When you're thinking about your food as medicine activities, what, what are the real meaningful changes that you're able to have? What does it mean to folks to be able to, to have a meal with their families that they weren't going to be able to have before because they got this box of food that, that sort of fits the kind of food that they would like to eat with their family? Like that stuff 
doesn't need to fall off of our, of our list of things that we're measuring. We also need to think about the quality of life for you folks that are in the clinics. Like I think one of the questions about, was about that this morning. It's one of the things I think we need to keep in mind too. Like, how does this make you feel? Is it a net stressor? Are we burning people out? Are we having a lot of turnover because we're trying to implement something that's not got enough resources behind it? Or is it a thing that makes the clinic staff want to wake up and go to work in the morning because they know that they're helping people live their life and improve the quality of life with their families? I think that's a question that we we can't forget to ask that if, if we're stuck, you know, on, on a certain smaller set of metrics sometimes. The last sort of thing that I, I'm supposed to quit in a minute, so I'm going to quit in a second so I can get out of here and don't get my eyeballs all messed up again, is like the the economic impact on communities here. You know, like if, if we're engaging community-based organizations, we're engaging the clinics, we're engaging all sorts of folks, and I'll I'll leave the policy conversation for, for another time. If we're engaging all the folks that we need to engage in food as medicine, you know, what does that do to our communities? You know, if, if our kids in food insecure households have better access to food because their parents have access to food as medicine, what does that do to our schools and to our workforce development? You know, if our philanthropic foundations can get engaged and do what Sunflower is doing here in Kansas, how can that help change the healthcare system? And what kind of economic benefit does that have for our communities? And see the nonprofits in this little town, you know, obviously the healthcare providers need to be involved. Our government agencies are involved. They're in the room and they're listening to you right now. Um, our farm stands, our small growers, like how can we help make sure that they stay a part of, as, of food as medicine? Is that an important value? What is the benefit of that to, to a place like Kansas in terms of food as medicine. I think all of those questions are things, like if we get really hung up on A1C, we might forget all of the benefits that can go along with implementing food as medicine as a sustainable part of our healthcare, citizen, our healthcare system. Oh my gosh. So that normally Carmen and I would stop here and we would say, what questions do you have to ask us? But I think what we're gonna do today is invite our clinics back up here. Some of you have already talked to Elizabeth about coming back up here. And if you'll come back up here, we're going to ask y'all some questions. And if you also have questions for us, you can ask us before we get out of town and protect, protect our eyeballs. <laughs> yes, the clinics are transitioning up here. If anybody has any quick questions for Carmen or Chris, go ahead and throw them out. And thanks to Carmen and Chris for coming all the way to Kansas. A uh, round of applause for them. Thank you. Based on Chris's feedback, I think our speaker gift bags now need to include eye drops and Flonase. Yeah. Um, I, I did visit a local Walgreens this morning, and you have an awesome selection of eye drops in your <laughs> local Walgreens. Slide over here. <laughs> So one of the questions that Carmen and I want to ask, and, and y'all can ask questions too, but we were asked to, to, to kick it off, I think, is what does your clinic need to do to be able to serve more patients? Like you all seem really excited about the prospects of food as medicine in clinics and in, here in Kansas. So what do you need and, and beyond money? So like, I guess I would guess that money is like number one thing, but what else besides money or what would you do with that money if you had access to more resources? Staff. <laughs> staff and time. Can you talk a little bit more? Because I think there are people in here that really want to hear some of the specifics. Like what staff members would you, if, if you had enough money to hire one or two staff members, what would their roles be? What would they, how would they help out? Well, we're, um, we're going to hire a team of community health workers. So I hope that that would. That will uh, definitely improve the engagement in the program. Um, I do also think that um, having a dietitian would be great um, that can, um, you know, oversee what the community health workers are doing or the coaches and um, staff. I think in general, um, staff being educated themselves about food as medicine and um, nutrition and just, you know, time to train staff on this type of work. So we got CHWs. We've got training for staff to help them get up to speed on how they can integrate that into their practices. 
what else? Any other any other folks or resources that y'all would y'all would like to have? I think um, when we think about the data collection, um, we all have EMR systems, and sometimes we have challenges with collecting the additional data. So there are modules that you can purchase. So part of it's money, but it's also um, setting up those systems to where they really work for the different programs um, for our patients. So a patient visits the clinic, they're not um, asked the same questions at all of these different touch points. It's a system that's integrated and the patient doesn't feel like they're going through different systems when they experience the health center. That, that's a really common comment that, that Carmen and I hear from clinics all over the place. Thank you for mentioning that. R what are you going to say? And that's, I think, just touching on that, the system as a whole, and just building those relationships. Um, that's one of the things out in our area and that rural location is just finding other counties, other resources. So we're not building the same thing multiple times. Um, we've talked about being kind of that hub for the distribution or the hub for resources to come into, and then we can partner with other counties. So taking that local approach to build that network um, of people that you can reach out to on your own. Awesome. Anybody else? Th those are awesome answers. I think also building capacity. So um, a lot of us are limited in space. Um, while we would like to serve more patients, um, there's only so much our food pantries can handle um, so many days between deliveries and um, the staff to actually take the items from the boxes and put them on the shelves and that whole system within the healthcare system that we're developing. One of my experiences in working in, on research, both with, with NIH and talking to the, the Feeding America partnerships is you might be surprised that there are not people in clinics sitting around with nothing to do most of the time. <laughs> like, so every one of these clinic system activities requires effort and somebody's both got to do the effort and pay for the effort. So I think that's that's also a very common situation that we hear about. Well, I'll take the next question then. Um, so building on what we've heard yesterday and today, a common theme I, I think I've heard is that this is hard work, um, but I am so inspired by the commitment of all of the clinics and the people um, and the systems that it takes to change. Um, so the question I have is, what what's inspiring you to keep going? It's hard work right now, and and what what's inspiring you? I can start. Um, for me personally, I love food. I love that engagement you can have with your family when you're cooking a meal together. Um, when I think about um, family gatherings when I was younger, when you know we had the extended families together the most fun was had in the kitchen. And um, I was fortunate enough to have a family that really um, developed healthy foods. And so to bring some of that to some some of our um, community members that maybe didn't have that experience, maybe their experience is more with, you know, the processed boxed foods. And so seeing patients get engaged and having some joy from that, um, I I feel like that's really important. So it's really the human connection between um, <clears throat> our staff and, and the patients. I would say just, uh, just the opportunity to make a difference, you know, um, and it's great to hear other, what else is going on. That's, that's very helpful. But, you know, I was talking yesterday about, uh, about seeing those same patients over and over again and not, you know, not really being able to, not feeling like I'm making a change, and the numbers telling me that their num that that their life isn't changing, their disease process is continuing. I'm not I'm not helping them like I wanted to help them, and so how are we going to do that um, when what we're doing doesn't work? We need to find a better model um, to make make that work. And this is uh, from my um, from my experience. Uh, at least a model and certainly probably a better model than than the one that we've been following for years, which is, you know, just uh, more medicine, more pills, more, uh, more of the same. And it's, and it's not working. So we need to find something that works. And, and this is something that seems to work. So that's inspiring. Yeah. So patient experiences, health outcomes, all things your evaluators are trying really hard to capture for you. Um, I think that it's an important perspective to, to relay that all of these evaluation efforts 
are hopefully also inspiring so that you can capture, clinics can capture what they're doing and how it is making a difference. And so um, not only for like personal clinic culture and engagement in the program, but also just having that feedback of like, I'm invested in this because, and it is making a difference and I can see it, so. Yeah, and I would just say, you know, I, I would agree what you're saying about not just paying attention to the A1C because that's what I'm seeing in our cooking classes is, I mean, I'm hopeful that A1Cs will improve and I think they will, but uh, what you're talking about is that human connection, you know, that um, that I'm learning people have the same problem that I have. and. And we both want to get better. And how can we work together and develop those relationships and have that encouragement from those relationships? And, and that's when we see when we get people together and cook together or learn together or whatever. That's a that's an important part of, of and kind of an unexpected part for me um, from what we're seeing when we're getting together and and you know sharing a common goal of improving our health. Mm -hmm. And along the lines of what Carmen was just talking about, you're, you have this awesome evaluation team. They they work for you, even though sometimes it may feel like you work for them when they ask you to give them data and look up stuff for them or whatever. But really, we scientists, evaluators work for people like you. We You just said, you know, you want to know things beyond A1C. What do you want to know? Like we talked a lot about metrics from Hillary all the way through till just right now. Like if there was one thing that you could wave a magic wand and your evaluators could tell you about what about the sort of health and operations and success of your programs, what would you most want them to be able to tell you? If there's a magic way to say that somebody's quality of life has improved, that's ultimately what we want to do, at least for in in my perspective. What would that look like? Because I think there are there are some not magic ways to show that like spoiler <laughs> but like survey <laughs> questions <laughs> yeah like i'm not trying to put you on the spot but like how would you know like if you had a patient sitting in front of you and you said oh her her quality of life has definitely improved how would you know i think it's a a bigger issue than um just the people in the room and and the people on zoom i think it's um looking at our entire ecosystem that we live in and starting to provide healthier um, choices and um, making that the norm for everyone. So we're talking about messaging on TV, you know, everything surrounding um, our lifestyles, you know, encouraging people to take the stairs instead of an elevator. You know, it's a huge, it's like a holistic approach to um, your life, but healthcare plays a big role in that. And we've gotten to the point where we're just relying on medications and, you know, just quick fixes to a problem that um, it's going to take some time to tackle. But I think that there's enough um, people that are interested at this point um, that I think we can make small strides. That's awesome. What, what else? Yeah, go ahead. I think one of the small things in our community that you could see um, quality of life improvement is if there were a farmer's market that becomes sustainable, that's since COVID come on, um, the farmer's market in Hoxie was shut down and it hasn't recovered. Um, so seeing some of those changes and those returns of those access to locally grown foods is definitely something that I think you could see as a bigger impact that you can measure um, if you have that sustainability. And that you would love to be able to see when your patients have access to funds, if they could be able to figure out how to, if, if you could see them showing up at the farmer's market, you would say like, All right, well, like we, we did something. Yeah, that's cool. I kind of want to take that one step further. What if we hand out um, vegetable plants at the beginning of the season and then, you know, they can at least um, have a fresh tomato to add to their salad or, you know, whatever. And, you know, believe it or not, it just takes a little bit of water and those things will survive. So and that's a cool evaluation. You, know, you could say, like, whose plant is still alive at the end of this program? <laughs> That's a that's probably like a pretty awesome proxy for like how well they're taking to heart the lessons that you're teaching them. That's that's very creative. I love it. So I'll ask another question. I might add one quick okay. thing. You know, I I mentioned yesterday. Um, uh, I I think we're in the in the business of transforming minds, and and how people relate to food. And so I'm not sure how you measure that. Um, you guys can probably figure that out, but, um, but that's what we want to do is we want people's 
understanding and relationship with food to change and to have them look at food differently than the way they're looking at it now. That's what's going to sustain beyond six weeks or 12 weeks or whatever. If they're looking at food differently, then, uh, then that, that can carry over for a year or five years or 10 years or whatever. So um, I think I'm going to take you to my community nutrition theory class. No, <laughs> just kidding. I see your evaluators writing down um, what you all are saying. So <laughs> um, I think this is great input and, um, you know, measuring everything from knowledge change to attitude change to behavior change um, around these programs are super important and helpful components to understand. Um, so my next question is, what is your vision for food as medicine in Kansas? Like, what what are you going for, or how would you know it was successful? I think starting small out where we're at is building other counties and getting that involvement. Um, and I think, like I kind of touched on my first comment, is building that regional approach, um, but each region being able to communicate. So you've got Northwest Kansas, you've got Southeast Kansas, but how are we collaborating and coming to events like this to share our knowledge and to build that impact of a larger state organization instead of just us staying in our isolated areas? Um, if everything was just in a vacuum and we could isolate just one thing, um, that would be great. But we're talking about all the diversity, the social impact, the economic impact, the access to travel. Um, each one of those things plays a part in this Um and making those connections as to how to build on those is important, I think. So do you see it integrated in the future, like starting small and then integrating or starting small and having like local focused efforts? That's the key word, integration. Yeah. We're an integrated care model. So I just, I feel like that, you know, food as medicine is a foundation of an integrated care model when it comes to integration of community of the healthcare providers, of all the services that the patient is, and those wraparound services that the patient needs um, to be um, approached in a, a holistic way and have the, the greatest outcomes mm -hmm. and lifestyle change and um, quality of life. It's just, that's huge. Yeah. Um, I think the future of food is medicine, like in like my vision for it, is that like every time somebody goes to, any part of the charitable food system, like whether that's one of our in-clinic food pantries or that's like a like one of the food pantries in our neighborhoods, um, or even if they are like signing up for SNAP or WIC somewhere, um, that that also comes with like a referral to a healthcare clinic, um, whether that's meeting with a dietitian or a community health worker. Um, and then like working also like in both directions so like every single provider at least in like our network it'd be great if like if they had like anything on the long list of like diet related things like anytime that they are referred to a dietitian that also includes here is food like we're going to tell you what you should eat and we are also going to give you that food um so like in both directions just across the board so integrating the food system with the healthcare system both ways. Yeah. Jumping in. <laughs> Kyle, I'm putting you on the spot. Yesterday when we were chatting, um, we came up with this niche market for the perfect entrepreneur or foodpreneur of what was it? A meal kit with what, you, tell me what we talked about that you said would be perfect for Hoxie patients and probably other patients. We're like, why is no one doing this? And some of that was just combining with um, what we're doing with the Magic Kitchen. Um, we'd reached out to Blue Apron. We reached out to HelloFresh. Um, and we got into kind of a barrier that for every two patients that we had enrolled, we had to set up another email account. Well, now we've got eight email accounts to try and feed these patients. Uh -huh. <laughs> so... I asked them yesterday, I said, what can you guys do as Sunflower to reach out to these people and create corporate accounts um, and making these meals diabetic friendly or um, hypertension friendly? Um, they've got the resources. They've already got the mailers. They've got the services and the ability to do this on a larger scale, but they're creating a barrier for us in a rural area where we've got to do more work to be able to serve more people. 
Um, if there was an easier way that we could just plug the names and the addresses in and pay one bill, perfect. We would do it. That's where we started taking it on ourselves. And Lisa, she, she spends half of her day, one day a week, creating these meal boxes for the eight patients that we're sending them to. So we're working with our hospital to get the food in. And then she goes down to our rec center and has a couple other people working with her, but we're creating those. So we're, we're taking a nurse out of the clinic to go do these things that we would be more than happy to outsource to be able to get that food to them. So I think what Elizabeth was saying is let's create our own little <laughs> meal box plan for the diabetics and the hypertension patients that we can send them out. But make it on a corporate level where you can have more than one account. That raises a question for me to, to ask you all as well is, you know, I said a minute ago and I've heard other people say, I've heard y'all say that like it matters that you get to do what you want regionally as part of this program. Would you rather that Elizabeth has a box that's like you open it up and it's like, Oh, food is medicine. Just did it. <laughs> no, no, no. No, not a, not a, not, I'm, yeah, I don't want to steal her business idea, but would you, if, if, if she had like, <laughs> this is what a food is medicine program is, and you just open the box and put it in your clinic and it's good to go. Would you like that sort of one size fits all kind of thing? Or does it matter that you have the ability to tailor it to your patients and your communities and your clinic settings? Cause I, I don't, I'm not a clinician. So I'm, I'm curious to hear what you think. Cause I know what, what, what feels like the right answer, but how does that work in real life? I feel like um, maybe a starter box <laughs> would be awesome, you know, um, but the ability to tailor it to our patients' needs and to change and adapt as we have things changing um, in our lives, like COVID did so much, like it reversed what we were doing. So if something like that comes up, we have to be able to pivot and change to still meet the needs of our patients and community. So um, I, I feel like some of the things that would be helpful would be those connections um, and structure to some programs where we could um, just tap in and say, hey, yes, we're interested in this. How do we get this service for our patients without trying to figure out all the nuts and bolts um, to how it would work? I feel like sometimes we're recreating systems that somebody has figured out. I just don't know how to I don't know who to connect to, to, to get that road roadmap. I think at community health center of Southeast Kansas, we would not be interested unless it was super customizable um, because we do have like two dietitians on staff who do the work to come up with like a, like really like patient tailored, like nutrition plan. And so like if it was just like a one size fits all box, I'm not sure that we would be interested in that, but it'd be great if they had like, like a dietitian like page where you like the dietitian would go in and customize it. Mm -hmm. um, and then like, that's what the corporate account looked like, then heck yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to you. No, also just, you know, inclusivity you know, the different cultures and backgrounds of our patients. Um, we always want to create a environment of belonging and look at the patient as the expert. Um, you know, I'm not the authority. I'm not the expert on what their needs are necessarily. So just listening to them. And um, I don't think a one size fits all when it comes to food as medicine or um, healthcare is um, necessarily going to always work. So um, giving them choices and looking the, at them as the expert and partnering with them and advocating for what, you know, those needs are. Is there anyone in the audience who has questions for, for our experts? Y'all are experts too, so. Or if you have something to share, it would be great to hear as well. We still hear mother. Thank you. Hi, so I, my mind just keeps going here. Has anyone um, engaged or reached out to any pharmacies to see if they, you know, might be able or interested in having, you know, food as part of their option? I'm just thinking, you know, they have the system. That's where the people go for their medicines, right? Or they get them through mail order or whatever. I, it, it's probably, probably wouldn't work or someone would have figured it out, but I just keep going there in my mind is, you know, has anybody explored that? 
So we do have an in-house pharmacy. Um, we haven't formalized the process yet, but we often take um, produce up there and it's distributed with the medications. Um, the, the thing with our pharmacy is it's a retail pharmacy as well as a, a 340B pharmacy. So um, the people that get the, the food are not necessarily our patients, but that's not a bad thing in my mind. So I think, you know, if there's a way we could do that on a broad scale with Walgreens and, you know, all the other pharmacies to say, you know, our providers writing a prescription for a box of food every time they refill, that would be amazing. Um, I'm not sure how that's going to work. Um, I'm going to have to stretch my brain a little more. <laughs> that could be the future though. Yeah. We have a, a new pharmacy as well. So um, I know that we're all um, looking to collaborate, but that might be in the next phase. <laughs> Um, we also have in-house pharmacies um, at at least five of our clinics, I think, um, and they do medication delivery every afternoon. Um, and so that's something that we're trying to tap into is having awesome. like including food delivery. Um, we're not going to be able to start that immediately because it is there's no like full time drivers dedicated to that. Um, and then. It's, so it's like pharmacy technicians and community health workers that are covering the delivery and that takes like their entire afternoon. Um, and then we're working out the logistics of having to get, um, like if, if they're not home to get the food, then it has to be like in a food safe, like freezer box. Um, so that's a whole nother logistic thing that we're considering. Um, but we also at the clinic have like a conference room that like a large conference room right next to our pharmacy. And I keep trying to talk to the <laughs> administration about like, can we have that and move our food pantry right there, right as soon as you come in, like a food pharmacy right next to the like the actual pharmacy. But yeah, I was talking to a to a food as medicine program not not in Kansas recently. And they use their pharmacy as a distribution point for for food boxes. And and yesterday we talked a little bit about one of the secret strengths of food as medicine is it's about building a relationship between that patient and their clinic and their providers. And you want to make it easier for them to, them to engage and, and both get the care that they need to manage their conditions, but also maybe show up at the place where they might refill their prescription if they have the money to do that on that day. So it's another sort of synergy where you're like getting people to the place that makes it just a little bit easier to manage their, their chronic condition. Not, you didn't do a good job with the mic today, so I'll let you go. I think we're uh, round of applause for the panel. Thanks again to Chris and Carmen for um, moderating that session for us and, um, and to the clinics for participating.